It's a call that's telling me I'm here to serve. It's a need to make a difference in the world. 24 hours, day or night, these healing hands will make it right. Looking in their eyes, I know that I'm changing lives. Changing lives. Changing lives for the better. For the better. Changing lives. Hi again, everyone. I'm Candace Kruger along with Jim Knox, and we're back again with another edition of the Best Docs Network featuring some of the best physicians in the Houston area that help change people's lives. And speaking of doctors helping change people's lives, we'll begin the show with our first best doctor. It's plastic surgeon Dr. Evan Feldman. In October of 2011, I was diagnosed with um, stage one breast cancer and was advised that I needed a lumpectomy with internal radiation. Maybe a gut feeling kind of told me that I needed a second opinion. After looking at all my history, she actually re recommended a bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction. So that's what I did on April 3rd of this year. Breast reconstruction is a very rewarding uh, surgery that we do for the patients. Um, it's uh, women who are going through you know, some of the most difficult times in their life. They've been given a diagnosis of cancer and been informed that they may lose one or both of their breasts. I came and talked to Dr. Feldman about the whole process and of course I was nervous and I know I even started crying at one point, but he was so, so supportive and just um, assured me so many times I would be in good hands and I would love the results. And So she uh, chose to have an expander, an implant-based reconstruction and uh, that uh, allows her to have a reconstruction that doesn't have a second surgical site. So uh, rather than having to use muscle from her back or from her abdomen and impacting her golf game or her or yoga or her active lifestyle, um, we're able to use uh, implant-based reconstruction, which is a, a very nice uh, result with really nice technology that's available to us now. Just fabulous, yes. And he, he did a great job and I had total confidence in him. And I've been feeling actually pretty good. I'm, kind of wanting to get out and play golf, which I haven't been able to yet, but actually I feel really good. Every patient has individual concerns, and whether it's lifestyle, whether it's recovery, whether it's, you know, can they get back to their job or take care of their kids, that's something that we take into consideration with every patient. The surgery's gone so well and she's so uh, confident with her results um, that she wants to be out and, get, and, and move on with her life and put the cancer behind her, and, uh, and we've really been able to deliver her uh, a nice result that she's able to, to do that with. So many exciting things have happened since then. Not only the good prognosis with the surgery, but we're, we're engaged now. Um, hopefully my daughter will be graduating from college soon and I'll be able to retire early next year and kind of just move on with my life in a, in a positive, positive direction. Originally, I was having a lot of sinus pressure, pretty much all the time I had sinus pressure. And I had a lot of headaches. I would have sinus infections pretty much back to back. I'd have several sinus infection, infections a year. Amanda has consulted multiple ready clinic uh, urgent care. That does not really address her problem. All they did was to refill her prescription of antibiotics, gave her some antihistamine, and tell her to go home. But what they do is they, they, they treat her symptoms instead of treating the, the, the cause of her problem. He basically just looked at my nose and kind of tried to figure out what the problems were based on the symptoms. And he noticed immediately that my turbinates were really big. The inferior turbinate, it's a normal structure in your nose that everybody has. It has a role of filtering and humidifying the air that you breathe in. So it becomes enlarged and inflamed when it is irritated by either allergies, infection or pollution in the air. Considering her busy schedule, we decide upon a two-prong uh, approach treatment. Uh, balloon sinuplasty in office to treat her sinus issue and inferior turbinate reduction to relieve her nasal obstruction. 
I don't really have any more sinus issues. I haven't had a sinus infection since the surgery, and it's been a few months now. The advantage of uh, balloon sinuplasty is that it can be done in office. There is no uh, general anesthesia. The cost is less than doing it in the hospital, and the recovery time is really quick. There's really no downtime. The patient can go back to their daily activities uh, quickly. It was, it's actually kind of funny. There's a lot of things that I didn't realize were issues until after the surgery. I know one time I was sitting in my bathroom and I was sitting there and there was a candle about two feet away from me and I actually could smell it. <laughs> that was something that I have never done before and it kind of just hit me. I was like, I can actually smell the candle. <laughs> we're all different. We like different things. But one thing nobody likes is pain especially when it keeps us from doing the things we love. Luckily, Pam is here. Whether it's back pain, carpal tunnel, foot and ankle pain, or more, PAMA physicians are dedicated to their specialties and dedicated to your quality of life. Don't let pain keep you from doing the things you love. PAMA, pain freedom. The Best Docs Network, of course, features some of the best physicians in the Houston area that are changing people's lives. Like our next doctor, it's allergist, Dr. Lynn Dickens. I think there's a lot of confusion now about exactly what an allergist is because a lot of people do allergy testing that are not board certified in allergy and immunology. So what we see actually in this practice is not always allergy, but people come to us because they think that it might be allergy. Well, Lil Garrett Mueller that uh, has been a patient of mine for quite a few years has multiple food allergies and this has really been his biggest problem in life is, is learning how to eat properly and um, not be different from the other kids. Um, his mother brought him to us early on and we were able to diagnose some of his food allergies and he, he has outgrown a few but he still has some that are very dangerous for him. Because allergies run in our family and things like asthma and things as well, we came and had him tested at the age of one. And at that point, we found out that he was allergic to all dairy products um, and also peanuts. So it changed how I had to shop and how we did things in, in our home. I would label foods that said, no, Garrett, and label things that said, okay, Garrett. We had a Garrett shelf. Actually, Garrett brought this to one of his um, office visits, and I was so amazed by it. This is Garrett's story of his life with food allergies and how it affected him. And he fully illustrated this book himself. And uh, it, it's pretty amazing from the time he was first diagnosed and how it affected his life. And this is a very verbal young man who, who knows what he needs to avoid and what he needs to do. So we're hoping that maybe one day he'll be able to be a little ambassador in the world for his food allergies. She talks with Garrett, she asks him questions as well as asking me, and she really listens and um, that helps us to, to be able to manage his allergies and his, his asthma. If you want a doctor who will take time with you, who will get to know you and um, work, work with you on your own preferences with the medicines and things like that, that, that Dr. Dickens is the person to see. I see lots of patients who worry about hair loss. Men worry about that male pattern baldness. There's not a lot you can do about that. The medications we have, both pills and creams, work a little bit, but not great. Women, however, tend to have a problem where they go through these phases where their hair gets really thin, and that can be very, very anxiety provoking. It is not unusual for the body and the hair follicles to go through phases where sometimes your hair will just be thin for months and months and months, and then it will reset itself. There's nothing you can do about that, really. Also, after you've had a real bad illness, for example, a high fever or some prolonged illness such as pneumonia, Sometimes, three to six months later, you, whether you're a man or a woman, may notice that your hair gets thin or you lose a lot of hair. That will be temporary. It's basically related to toxicity from your illness on your hair follicles, causing them to go into a temporary period of time that they don't properly grow. So don't look for all kinds of over-the-counter cures. It's mainly not going to help you. Just give it some time and it'll take care of itself.
One of the things that I learned early from Dr. Tabar, who was the person in Sweden who did that two-county trial, and that was my first introduction to real quality mammography and how it should be done. But I learned that we needed to work together and you needed to understand the pathology. So immediately the first uh, benefit was to work closely with the pathologist. Dr. Rose and Dr. Sutton enticed me uh, to go to a meeting out in California where Dr. Laszlo Tabar was speaking on mammography and sophisticated ways to diagnose early breast cancer. And to say that I got hooked by Dr. Tabar would be an understatement. And so we came back uh, in late 1995 and determined we wanted to form a comprehensive breast center. Uh, at the time that we started this format, we were really the only uh, area in Houston outside maybe the medical center itself in which this was a routine sort of event of um, a meeting on a weekly basis with all the different uh, physicians involved with uh, the breast cancer diagnosis and treatment and treatment planning. It's important that when we find an abnormality that the radiologist understands the pathology, knows what to biopsy, when to biopsy, and then can communicate that back to the referring physician, communicate it to the patient, and communicate to the pathologist what our concerns are. I think the uh, most powerful thing that we have been doing for close to 20 years um, is the, uh, the weekly conference and it's dedicated to women who are recently diagnosed. And so it takes an element of commitment on all the, the different um, parties involved, but at the same time when you see the benefit of that as far as uh, our ability to do a much better job taking care of the patient, it's, it's worth every second. So it really means working together as a team, working with your breast surgeons, working with the pathologist, working with the radiation oncologist, the plastic surgeons, and we work as a team. If you've had a doctor help change your life, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. Here at Revella Plastic Surgery, we perform plastic and reconstructive surgery. We emphasize aesthetic procedures, primarily of the breast, body, and face. I was predisposed to uh, like a droopy uh, jawline, and so that began to be my focus when I looked at myself in the mirror. Cheryl came to me with the concerns about her, again, the jowling area and deep lines on her face. Um, she's a yoga instructor, and in particular the Bikram type of yoga where it's very hot and I think she perspires a lot and is very thin and she noticed her skin sagging. So to help her with that, we uh, did what we call a mini facelift. I talked to um, the staff first and then had a consultation with Dr. Avella and he recommended doing a mini lift. Uh, I felt like I was ready to do that and you know just with some guidance and the questions that I asked and the way they were answered I felt like uh, it was a comfortable procedure for me to move forward with. In general most of the patients are women that come for a facelift. They're in their early to mid 50s. They have the signs of some jowls and what we call marionette lines. Those are lines that go down on each corner of the mouth. They have some wrinkled skin on their neck and so that would be probably the ideal patient. I'm only three weeks out of my surgery. I feel like, you know, I'm really happy with the results. Well, it's a good feeling to know that she now feels more confident and she's of course smiling and very happy with the results. So of course I feel good about it. I feel like that with the, the advice and the treatment and the service, that I get at Ravella Plastic Surgery, I'm able to really maintain a level of confidence that allows me to uh, get in front of people and, you know, most of the time with no makeup on, and uh, I feel really good about myself. Don't forget, for more information on all the great doctors you see on today's show, head to the website, bestdocsnetwork.com. 
BestDocsNetwork.com, the place to go to find the right doctor. And now we're gonna head to our next doctor. It's gynecologist Maurice Liebman. Probably for the better part of 10 years, when I would call for sneeze, I would release urine. The leaky bladder is extremely common. And I think one of the biggest issues is that women just don't like to talk about it. They think they have to put up with it or they're somewhat reluctant to talk about it in the office to, to their doctor. It finally got to the point where it, it was interfering with stuff. I had to carry extra underwear and clothes to work or I'd have to go home in the middle of the day. And it was, it was I don't think anyone ever noticed, but I felt embarrassed and uncomfortable. And that was what finally made me decide to get tested to see if my problem was due to um, the incontinence that this would fix. The procedure now is also a minimally invasive procedure and it involves placing a small piece of mesh underneath the urethra, that's the tube that goes from the bladder to, to the outside, and it, it forms just a hammock or sling underneath the urethra and when placed correctly it, uh, it has an over 90% chance of success. After I had it done, I told Dr. Liebman I wish I had done this five years ago because it, it made that much of a difference. And, but I thought I was too young, and so I convinced myself, oh, this, you don't have this, it's something else. This isn't going to fix your problem, and so I just didn't ever talk to him about it. So I should have talked to him sooner. The recovery is, is also just wonderful. It's done as an outpatient. This procedure is still done as an outpatient in an in a, uh, outpatient facility or freestanding outpatient clinic and uh, the patient will go home again have something to eat maybe take some pain medicine but very little discomfort associated with it I sneeze nothing not a single drop and that's it's been two years now I mean it's completely changed my life very little discomfort associated with it and what's really nice about it is that it's effective immediately if it's going to work it's She'll tell you the next day she hasn't leaked, uh, much to her surprise. Keith had severe sinus problems until he met Dr. James Ludwig. To find out more about Keith's story and other life-changing stories, log on to BestTalksNetwork.com. I went to a walk-in clinic one night. They told me I was having a heart attack sent me to the emergency room. It wasn't a heart attack, but they did run the test. The cardiologist told me that I had slight blockage. He said, you can save your life by having that surgery that you're scared to do, or you can be dead within a year. She had high blood pressure, high uh, lipids in the blood. I think she had some asthma, um, chronic back pain, depression. I mean, these are all comorbidities, we call them, of obesity. Um, and her weight was out of control and going in the wrong direction and she was heading for a big problem. So I contacted the office and my son and I did it together. We actually came to the seminar, he did his first, I did mine second and it's been a little over three years. Uh, a gastric bypass is where we uh, create a small pouch of the stomach at the top and then we bring some intestine up and hook it on to that pouch, bypassing the majority of the stomach in the very first part of the intestine. I can eat pretty much anything. It's, I have to watch and maintain for the rest of my life because this surgery gets you to the low point of your weight, then it's up to you to maintain it and take care of it for the rest of your life. Well, she was 330 pounds before she started. I think she's 148 pounds now. It's, that's a significant weight loss, I think, in anybody's book. Um, and that's not atypical for a gastric bypass. That would sort of be what we hope for and expect, and she's well within the bell curve of our outcomes. My advice would be it is a life changer, but it's just I did it to save my life. Some people want to do it to, for, to be vain. I didn't. I wanted to save my life and live a long time because I had kids. Nobody wants to have an operation. It's not not fun. It hurts. You miss work. But the benefit to be gained is significant. Uh, and the change in life is significant and once the patients start to move in the right direction their whole attitude usually improves quite a bit and they're much more happy. It gave me energy, 
It has inspired me to be and do more than I thought I could ever do in my life. For more information on all the outstanding doctors you see on today's show, head to the website. It's bestdocsnetwork.com. That is bestdocsnetwork.com, the place to go to find one of the top doctors. Check out the outstanding stories of doctors helping change people's lives in the Houston area, like our next doctor, Dr. Meredith Morgan. What we want to do is try to help a woman uh, get through this time frame with the intense symptomatology. According to Dr. Meredith Morgan, intervention and management needs to be tailored to the level of severity. Uh, for mild hot flashes, home remedy self-management techniques are, are effective. For some women, yoga will work. Other women, uh, strenuous exercise. On average, you can't say that either one of them really works for everybody. But if it's good enough for an individual woman, it's good enough, and that's all she needs. There is a technique of breathing that's um, derived from transcendental meditation that actually has been studied quite a bit and found to be quite effective. There are two sets of data on the research, and there are different sets of outcomes and benefits and hazards involved in using hormones. In general, we try to start with a low dose and let the patient titrate up to a level that will produce a circulating estrogen level that's satisfactory for her response. Now there are concerns with hormone therapy. What Dr. Morgan would like to point out is that there are three major concerns against the others. First, breast cancer, everybody's concerned about breast cancer. Uh, second is heart attacks, and that's, that's serious. But the most common one that we really address all the time is estrogen, and there's been very little historical interest. Your question was, what are we doing now as opposed to 10 years ago? Uh, we really haven't changed much in our concept about blood clots. Uh, for that reason, our preference is to try to use the non-pill forms of estrogen as much as possible. The pills go through the liver, and simply put, can increase blood clotting chemicals and the risk of blood clotting. Now the most common question for most women for Dr. Morgan is, how will I know what I'm going to be confronted with? Well, the good news, according to Dr. Meredith Morgan, is that menopause is controllable. Basic message I'd like you to get is there are many ways to approach this. This is not going to be incapacitating. It's controllable. Maybe the control is the goal. We're not going to have terminal hot flashes. My symptoms are, you know, I don't want to walk on the ball of my foot. Uh, it, shoot, it shoots sharp pains up my leg. I mean, it feels like a nerve's being pinched off. Wanda's a patient that presented to my office complaining of shooting pain. Uh, you know, down her heel, upper leg, and uh, so immediately I started thinking maybe there's a possibility of a nerve, uh, you know, compression. I told him my symptoms. He suspected what it was. He wheeled in a little mini ultrasound machine, did it right there on the spot, and you know, diagnosed the problem. And we set up surgery because I had already tried other treatments with other doctors and it didn't work, and we were done. This is your ankle joint and you have a major nerve that courses through here. There's a natural tunnel. It's called your tarsal tunnel. What happens is the tunnels get real tight and they clamp on the nerve are the protective covering, which we call the flexor inoculum. The nerve tends to get stuck underneath it. So what happens is when the nerve gets compressed, it's extremely painful. What he's trying to do is avoid that numbness. And for most people, it works. You know, you basically take what's pinching the nerve off away and you make room for it and life goes on. And the advantage of this is like it's not a surgery where you're really held up for a while where you have to you know stay at home and you can't put weight because I want the patient walking as soon as they can because I don't want those tunnels to tighten up or to close up. So I want to make sure the nerves can glide. Wanda had tarsal tunnel surgery. Uh, she comes back to the office three to five days later and uh, just dressing change. No need for x-rays because we're not doing any bone work, uh, which is great too, because if you're not doing bone work, it's not necessarily as painful. There's less swelling. Uh, and so two weeks later, sutures are out and she's walking on her own. I'm very happy. I've actually recommended him and, and all my friends that have gone to him, and they've had more extensive things done to them where you know, you're reattaching muscles and putting in screws, you know, really crazy stuff. Um, they, they also think he's awesome. The side effect that one has from nerve decompression is not pain. It's 
lack of sensation, it's numbness. And that's temporary because with time they regain their sensation, but it's a really easy recovery and it provides immediate relief. Fatigue is a very common problem. What are the causes of fatigue? Well, sleep disorders can cause fatigue. For example, if you have sleep apnea where you gasp or choke at night, that can cause you to be tired. So can snoring, so can fragmented sleep where you awaken a lot during the night. All of those can make you tired, as well as not sleeping enough hours. Taking naps can interrupt the quality of your sleep at nighttime, and therefore you're going to need another nap because you're tired. So reducing your naps will help a lot. Certain diseases can cause fatigue, for example, thyroid problems, anemia, diabetes, and hypertension. These should be checked up on at your physician's office. If you're on certain medications, some of them can cause fatigue, especially some of the medications we use to treat hypertension. Depression and stress are common causes for fatigue. For example, people who are stressed out a lot, they're going to have bad sleep, and they're just going to burn up their adrenaline during the day being stressed, and they're going to be real tired. Depression and sadness will cause you to be uh, sleepy and tired throughout the day, so getting those diseases treated can help a lot. So if you're tired of being tired, think about the things I've talked about and try to get them checked out. Dorothy, she had multiple teeth that were decayed and she had failing restoration. So she had a history of having multiple dental procedures on her natural teeth. And these restorations had subsequently failed over time, secondary to wear uh, as well as decay. I came to see Dr. Metz and I was, of course, just knocked out. <laughs> My heart went, <laughs> he was so nice and encouraging. He said, yes, I think we can help you. At 90 years old, she had all her lower teeth removed in placement of four dental implants and also placement of an immediate prototype, so to speak. So she had fixed teeth on the day that her teeth were removed. Right. I had no problem whatsoever. It worked. I went, I, it, I, I, could, I could eat and chew and, and I looked normal. And uh, I was I was just perfectly happy with it. Her situation is not unique. There's many people in her age group that just by virtue of their age, their teeth are beginning to fail. Many of them are under the misconception that they're too old to have oral surgery safely. Um, although by virtue of their age, that age bracket, we do more implants in that age bracket than any other age bracket. So they do tremendously well with it, just like somebody much younger. And also their health improves afterwards. And I just was thrilled. That first steak was like, out of heaven, it was paradise. You know, it was just wonderful. I was so thrilled and happy. You know, with their fixed teeth, they're able to chew what they want and not foods that are high in sugar. And so they're healthier in the long run. For one, they're not fighting infected teeth. They have a healthier state in their mouth and they're able to chew what they want. And they're able to have a much more balanced diet. I would say, don't do that. Don't tough it out. Go get something to, <laughs> go get some dental implants <laughs> and be comfortable like I am. When you ask these individuals after they've had this, this procedure done, they say they feel more energetic. They just feel better. And then we feel that it's their body not fighting a chronic infection, that they're in a healthier state overall. That'll do it. That'll wrap up another edition of the Best Docs Network, featuring some of the best physicians in the Houston area that have helped change people's lives. And a reminder here, don't forget, for more information on all the outstanding doctors you've seen on today's show, head to the website, bestdocsnetwork.com, the place to go to find some of the best doctors in the entire Houston area. And if you have a question or comment for us, we want to hear from you. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. There you go. So long, everyone. We will see you next week.